Welcome everyone to our Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health. So I'm Cynthia Minkovitz, Chair of the Department, and it gives me enormous pleasure to greet you for the 15th Annual Harper Lecture and to introduce our honored guests. Joining us today will be four of Dr. Harper's family, his daughters, Nene Edwards Harper and Jeannie Harper Jones, and two of his grandchildren, Allie and Justin. It's so wonderful to have you joining us once again this year in honoring your dad and grandfather's memory and his many contributions to both population, family, and reproductive health and the broader field of public health. Before we get started, I'd like to share with you a bit about Paul Harper and his incredible legacy. Dr. Harper was a pediatrician, one of the founders of the population movement, and also a firm believer in prevention. He completed his MPH here at Hopkins and was appointed chair of the division and then the Department of Maternal and Child Health from 1947 to 1970. And I just have to comment on how remarkable it is for one individual to have chaired an academic department for more than 20 years. As the biography in your calendar invite notes, Dr. Harper was a visionary teacher and leader. What the bio doesn't share, but is so fitting to note given the focus of today's lecture is the breadth and depth of his 1962 textbook, Preventive Pediatrics, Child Health and Development. He acknowledged many common conditions in pediatrics recognized at the time, as well as the need to focus on emerging problems related to physical, emotional, and mental health. He astutely commented that at the time, there were many newly recognized issues too that were emerging, such as injuries, then called accidents. And he identified that these were examples of broad social problems with variable medical content, which increasingly will require joint study and action by several social agencies, including medicine and public health. Delivering the Harper Lecture this year is Dr. Charles Irwin, Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics, Director of the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine, and Director of Health Policy in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine and the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospitals. He leads the Adolescent and Young Adult Health National Resource Center, and he's led an interdisciplinary training program in adolescent health for more than 30 years, 40 years rather, and trained over 300 health and medicine professionals. His current health services research program focuses on improving preventive screening and clinical settings for young people and the financial and structural issues that influence adolescents and young adults' ability to actually access healthcare. His work, like that of Dr. Harper's, focuses on prevention, as well as social and societal issues that impact the lives of adolescents and young adults. Dr. Irwin is a close colleague and friend to many in the department. He's also reviewed many PFRH manuscript submissions during his 15 years as editor of the Journal of Adolescent Health. He's received national awards from multiple professional societies and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau for his impactful contributions of improving the lives of adolescents and young adults and in training the next generation of adolescent experts. We're greatly honored by Dr. Irwin serving as this year's Harper Lecturer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Irwin who will share his expertise regarding translating adolescent and young adult health research into clinical practice and health policy. Welcome. Thank you, Cynthia, for a uh, very kind introduction. Um, good afternoon um, on the East Coast. Good morning on the West Coast. And uh, I'm really honored to be here as the 15th Annual Paul A. Harper Lecture. Uh, from my brief review of Dr. Harper's work on behalf of families and their children, he was instrumental in making a difference in the health and well being of many families and training a large cohort of professionals who have followed in his footsteps. I'm certain that he would be surprised to hear the lecture honoring him is being given virtually from the West Coast. And I too would never have imagined that this would be done virtually when Dr. Minkovitz called me about uh, long before the pandemic. I'm also pleased that many members of his family are present with this important day that recognizes Dr. Harper for his contributions to maternal and child health throughout the world. I chose the title for my presentation because for the last 40 years, I've had the good fortune to be a member of the University of California, San Francisco faculty. Uh, none of my accomplishments would have been possible without being surrounded by an incredible group of faculty members and fellows and trainees that always challenge what we do 
and point us in new directions. These policies that for adolescents and young adults encompass laws and regulations as well as guidelines and system-based practices. Policy has impact on young adult and adolescent health and well-being so that when they leave the second day of life, second decade of life, they are thriving. The two foci of the presentation today, uh, which really encompass the work uh, that we do here at UCSF, the first will highlight the development of an evidence-based clinical preventative services for adolescents and how we monitored their impact on health outcomes. And the second area will focus uh, exclusively on policies that have been implemented over the last three decades at the federal and state level. And we will share some of the monitoring uh, that we have done on their impact. What is prevention? Prevention is really a balance between two areas. One, community services, community preventive services that are generally provided in the public health realm and then clinical preventive services that are based within clinical practices. It is essential that this balance really is, is looked at because as a clinician, when young people come to see you, if you're in screening them, it would be helpful to know what kinds of messages they're getting in the community if they either support what you're going to be telling them or what you're not going to be telling them. So we're going to focus a lot on clinical preventive services and just want to get clarity on the definition. These are services that are delivered by a clinician in a, in a setting that promotes the health and well-being of them. The services are generally designed to, present, to prevent the onset of various physical and behavioral health disorders or to identify problems or assets early in order to minimize or maximize their impact. So why should we provide clinical preventative services? This cartoon from the New Yorker, we're running a little behind. So I'd like each of you to ask yourself, am I really that sick or would I just be wasting the doctor's valuable time? The message here is interesting because it really speaks to the issue, where does prevention fit? Because if you're sitting in the doctor's office and you're saying to yourself, why am I here? I'm not really that sick. Uh, it raises a huge issue. It also gives a message that doctors only are interested in sick people. So I think that to move beyond that, that's what we've been talking about for years. In, in 2011, uh, Gore uh, wrote an article that I think was revolutionary in terms of looking at the global burden of disease in young people aged 10 to 24 years of age. And as you can see, he, uh, he really identifies uh, uh, the areas within each age group. There are many uh, commonalities within the age group. RTA is not renal tubular acidosis. It's uh, road traffic accidents, which, uh, you know, as Cynthia pointed out, we're not using word accidents anymore, but it still is in the literature. And if you looked at these, these areas that he has identified, over half of them are really areas that prevention should be addressing. And so that what I do is put this big red arrow across them saying, this is what we're, we should be doing. So, and this side just further enhances what the, the previous slide uh, says that the majority of mortality during adolescence is preventable the behaviors responsible for le the leading causes of morbidity, morbidity and mortality during adulthood are initiated or at their onset during the second decade of life. And many of these behaviors have partners. So for example, uh, substance use and driving, if you're using substances and driving, that's, uh, that's a no brainer really. And that uh, these costs of these behaviors and these disorders are high an article in 2015 by Gray et al. estimated that over about $11 million is spent on these areas that we could be putting towards uh, better issues. So the other issue about preventive services, there are expectations from adolescents and parents. Uh, they, they view clinicians as really a credible resource for information. 
The families expect clinicians will provide guidance about health behaviors. Um, and that most adolescents in the United States see some type of primary care clinician at least once per year for some form of health care. So it could include prevention, it could include sick care, but it, almost all of them walk into some clinical setting in which they see a provider. I would argue that there's a lot of underutilized time in clinical practice for pediatricians. I'm certain that many pediatricians would disagree with me in this, but I give a lecture here at, uh, in, the, in the department that's called Caring for Adolescents Without Your Otoscope. And it really builds on where we should be spending our time. And telehealth has really enabled us to do much more in reaching out, reaching more young people. However, we still need to do certain things. There's no way one could do a pelvic exam or do a um, sexual maturation uh, exam without seeing a patient for, uh, clinically in person. So what about the effectiveness of clinical preventative interventions? Uh, primary care clinicians have actually done a better job in adults. There have been a number of uh, uh, well-controlled co well clinical trials where office-based interventions have worked for adults. There's some e efforts now in terms of uh, looking at depression screening, and it looks like some of this depression screening in adolescents has a value and is, is worth doing. And there's some kind of evidence that office-based interventions that focus on contraceptive use have been successful at decreasing unintended pregnancies. I wanna just highlight the clinical guidelines that are available. Um, many of the guidelines are embedded within guidelines that go beyond adolescence. And then there are some specific guidelines that are focused exclusively on adolescence. For example, the guidelines for adolescent preventative services from the American Medical Association in 1994 was exclusively focused on adolescence. Bright Futures now has two areas within the book that focus on adolescence in young adulthood. And within the uh, NCQA now, there are specific measures that focus on adolescence and the US Preventive Service Task Force has specific recommendations for adolescence. So we really have a whole group of guidelines that can guide us in what we're doing for young people. We've chosen to focus our work really on this adolescent wealth use, well visit in particular because NCQA, Bright Futures, GAPS, HEDIS, they all point to the adolescent well visit as an important measure. And uh, the, what we're, the way we look at this, uh, the well visit is informs families of the importance of a well visit and time alone with the provider uh, that primary care providers need to screen for risky behaviors and other behavioral disorders and really speak to their strengths of young people as well as their risky behaviors. And the adolescent needs to have some time alone with the clinician during the preventative visit, which I uh, will show you data in, in down the line a little bit, that not many young people are getting time alone with a clinician. What a share with you some work that we've done within the Kaiser system. Um, although before we get there, I wanna make certain that um, the reason we decided to go with uh, doing some work within the Kaiser system is that we really identified that many young people were not getting well care in any uh, reasonable way, that, that screening and counseling, even when young people get well care, is not done for a lot of areas. And that most national screening outcome data for adolescents are from parents' reports, physician records, or health plans. Rarely do we have data on what adolescents experience in a clinical um, interview or, or visit. And then few longitudinal studies also either, either measure the outcomes of clinical care from, their adoles from the adolescent. So we really don't know if we're having any impact when we're putting all this energy and getting young people in for this welfare visit. 
So we began, we did a preventative intervention study at UCSF Kaiser, not UCSF Kaiser, with, with UCSF and Kaiser. The reason we chose Kaiser uh, Permanente to work with is the pediatric clinics uh, were amenable to doing research that a third of children in Northern California are served by Kaiser Permanente. And over 90,000 adolescents a year make at least one visit to a Kaiser clinic in Northern California. They also have great data, Kaiser does, and they also have uh, people stay in their practices. They don't usually jump around uh, from year to year. When you're a Kaiser patient, you generally stay there for many years. And we were particularly wanting to be following young people for a minimum of three years. The areas that we tend that we decided to intervene on was tobacco, alcohol, sexual behavior, seatbelt use, and helmet use. We did not intend to use to do screening for drugs. However, the Kaiser physicians wanted us to add drugs to it, so we added drugs to our screening uh, screening practices. This intervention was developed. Um, using this kind of model that we have here. We wanted, first of all, to know what was going on in these clinical practices before we touched them. Um, so we, I will show you some data in a little bit on what was happening in the Kaiser practices before we got engaged. Uh, we did provider training. Uh, the training was very intense. Every physician uh, needed to attend eight hours of training uh, at which they learned how to talk with teenagers. Uh, we had teenage actors and actresses that uh, presented them with uh, issues that they uh, needed to address. Uh, the actual training was such that each clinician was um, worked with a member of our faculty and then a member of their group and each of them the two individuals from the Kaiser group got an opportunity to observe each other, give recommendations how they might improve what they were doing. We had tools that were easy to record on what adolescents were doing. We also developed messages that teenagers would be given, consistent messages that they would be given for both positive messages and both how they might change. And if a young person was identified within the practice, that was engaging in several risky behaviors, he or she was then referred to a health educator who also worked with them and saw them back for future appointments. And then we monitored how we improved the services and what the outcomes were for our adolescents. So there were guidelines for each intervention site. All clinicians in the practice had to agree to participate in the intervention. So it was a clinic we were evaluating really a clinic, not the individual providers. We had 10 sites in California that agreed to do this. We interviewed 30 sites, 10 sites agreed. We got 10 sites that all of the docs uh, and nurse practitioners would participate. They collaborated on the development of the recruitment process, the screening practices, charting forms, training, patient flow, and the messages to adolescents which we worked for many, many weeks to get clarity in messages. There was a study champion at each site, monthly meetings with a working committee of five to 10 MDs and other staff, and Kaiser Northern California system was on board in doing this. So let us, so we decided to use this mnemonic, be safe, uh, First, we uh, would screen for the behavior. We would know, want to know when it started in the young person. We want to know, know how much they were doing it, how often they were doing it, and the context. So this screening uh, would be, there would be two directions. Uh, if the young person was engaging in no risky behavior, oftentimes when you're not doing anything that might injure yourself or hurt yourself, you don't get any positive reinforcement. We felt it was really important to reinforce uh, that young people were making good choices 
and uh, to keep up the good work, etc. If they were engaging in behavior, we then explored more carefully what the environment was, what the context was, expressing our concern about what they were doing, and also uh, suggesting or reaffirming that we were here to help them when they were willing to continue to work on this. I want to just use safety as one of the areas of messages when I'm not going to go through all of the, uh, them because it would take too much time. But these were the key messages for safety. So wearing a seatbelt is the safest thing you can do to prevent an injury while you're riding in a car. For those individuals that were not wearing a seatbelt, does your car have a seatbelt? Let's talk about how you can remember to fasten it while in the car. So we're really kind of proactively trying to uh, assist the young person in change. Message, if they were wearing a helmet while bicycling, using a motor scooter, skateboard, it's the safest thing you can do to prevent an injury. Uh, we want to really reaffirm this. Early adolescents really are using uh, skateboards or using bicycles. We want to make certain that we pay attention to that early adolescent group. And for, th for the teenagers who are not wearing a helmet, or for either uh, bicycling or skateboard, we assumed that these young people would decide eventually. So we wanted to make certain when you decide to wear a helmet, and if you cannot afford to buy one, I can help you or speak with your parents about the importance of you wearing a helmet and find one at a reduced price. And in fact, Kaiser was willing to give, to give helmets to young people that were willing to change. Let me look at, uh, let us look at some of the evaluation of the intervention to increase the delivery of these services. We had, uh, we started with 14 year old adolescents. They were recruited from scheduled well visits in pediatric clinics after our sample were females and half males. We followed up these young people for one and two years and they agreed to be followed uh, in the clinic for a yearly visit. We developed these um, uh, screening outcome measures. So we wanted to know if the doctor asked if you had used your seatbelt while riding in a car. And we also wanted to know, did your doctor remind you? So we we're also looking for screening and counseling. Were you getting screened and were you getting counseled uh, about what you were doing? Now I'm gonna go backwards a little bit because, um, so this gives you some of our data on the practices. And we had an intervention cohort with three, three practices. Our comparison sites were the, the seven practices that we chose to put on a wait list for getting the intervention training. These, the training, um, the pre-training data is from when we went to the 10 sites and asked them to be a part of this program. And we asked them to fill out forms to tell us what they were doing around seatbelt use, and what they were doing around helmet use, and what we we're doing, all these behaviors. So you can see both pre-training, the comparison intervention sites look pretty similar. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then if you look post-training, I think it's pretty remarkable that our clinicians were over 80% in what they were doing. And in fact, the comparison sites stayed relatively constant. Some increase in certain, certain areas, for example, the helmet use in the comparison site was pretty high. Uh, and I'm certain some of that was due to the Kaiser Permanente giving helmets out to their to the patients. Now we're going to go to the comparison sites. I want to make certain that you know these comparative samples were the non-intervention pediatric clinics, which I already mentioned. We also use the California uh, Health Interview Study, which is a population-based study similar to the National Health Interview Study. The difference in the California Health Interview Study is an adolescent component to that study, which looks at adolescents, what they're actually doing and from their reports, not from anyone else's reports. So the unanswered question for us, uh, and the reason we are so interested in doing this work is if providers screen for adolescents for risky behaviors, 
doesn't have an effect on their health outcomes because um, we spend a lot of time screening and we'd like to know if we're getting any bang for our buck, so to speak. Again, this just reviews for you. These are the 1,200 adolescents that started with us. They were 14 years of old age, and they had agreed to come back to clinic at 15 and 16 year olds for well visits. And I'm gonna walk you through the health behavior rates for intervention in comparison samples now. So this is the intervention versus comparison safety group. And it looks at both the intervention site and the comparison site. And you can see there's pretty remarkable differences between these sites. And the next slide will summarize this. So seatbelt use all the time, it increased about 100% higher in the intervention group between ages 14 to 16. Uh, and helmet use all the time increased about the remarkably. And then if we look at substance use, um, regular tobacco use, every used alcohol and every used drugs. So the intervention site, as you can see, uh, there are some really remarkable findings in regular tobacco use and ever used alcohol. The comparison site is this CHIS sample, uh, which looks at what adolescents do at these different ages. And as you can see, there are increases in this. But then when we look at our analysis here, the tobacco increase in regular smoking was actually much lower than our comparison site. Uh, the increase in al alcohol use was much lower than our comparison site. And there was some effect on the drugs increase, but it did not rise to the level of significance. Our next slide is on sexual behavior and intervention versus comparison. And we have both population-based data here from CHIS as well as comparison of, pedi of the pediatric data. And these changes are interesting because if you think about when young people begin sexual uh, intercourse and se sexual relationships, you would expect increases over time. So even though these um, indication, these results did not rise to a point of significance, the increase in sexual intercourse was about 30% lower in our pediatric and population-based comparisons sites. So I think it's interesting to say that there is some, there are possible some effect so our intervention had the most dramatic effect in the area of safety uh, in seatbelt and helmet use. The intervention was, uh, were real, the inter adolescents in the intervention side were much less likely to have tried alcohol and drugs, but the, and the intervention showed some promise of delaying sexual onset among younger teens. This implementation research really resulted uh, enough that Kaiser changed their standard of care for adolescents by integrating all the, school, the screening tools into their EMR throughout the region, and then also integrating a full-time behavioral health specialist into each practice to continue to really support uh, the pediatrician practices. I would like to also share with you the Kaiser system only allows uh, uh, physicians or a nurse practitioner to have a maximum of 24 minutes for a well visit and our practices were able to do the screening within 24 minutes, as well as do all of the, the remainder of the activities for that well care. Because usually people say, you know, we don't have enough time to do it, but Kaiser was able to do it. I think some of it was the incredible support we had from the system to integrate things in a way that didn't uh, supported what we were doing. So from my perspective, some of the next steps are, we need more system level efforts uh, to increase for rates of preventive care visits through research of continuous quality improvement. And we really continue to need our efforts to determine the efficacy of preventive intervention and what works best in clinical practice and not expect clinical practices to do something that's not, they can't do. I think the other thing that arise from all of this is our work on advocacy for public policy that needs to be based on science. 
So now I'm going to switch to public policy interventions. So since 2009, there have been some major efforts uh, at the level of policy to improve what's happening uh, for adolescents and young adults. Through the ACA, there were a tremendous focus on financing of care. The Child Health Insurance pre uh, Program reauthorization in 29 led to the development of quality measures, which included adolescents. The Maternal and Child Health Bureau in 2016 uh, developed Title V state specific national performance measures and it would require the states to identify one national performance measure for adolescents, which had never been called out before. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Health and Human Services, um, CMS, HHS, telehealth ruling in 2020 has changed what we're doing for adolescents and young adults, probably. Uh, we may never return to what we were doing previously. And the Cures Act, uh, for open access of health records with full implementation in April of 2021 has thrown a really um, big rock at all of us who are taking care of adolescents and how we're gonna to continue to take care of them in a uh, deal with confidentiality. So let's deal with the ACA first. Um, it made private plans purchased by families and small businesses more accessible it also requires that most private plans were to offer dependent coverage up through 26. Um, and it gave states the option to expand Medicaid to cover adults up to 133% of federal poverty level. This um, map of the United States highlights really the status of where the states are that expanded more, 39 states expanded to include Medicaid. Two states are now in the process of adopting it. They've adopted it, but they have not implemented Missouri and Oklahoma. And then there's uh, 12 states that have chosen not to adopt it. So we have this patchwork of where you want to live if you are on Medicaid, because certain places you're not going to get great care. So this slide from the National Health Interview Survey shows the impact on health insurance coverage for adolescents and young adults pre and post ACA. As you can see, adolescents got a little jump, about 6%, but the real uh, individuals who got the biggest bang out of this uh, coverage was young adults, in which they moved from 62% to 81%. Still about 20% of young adults uh, are not uh, insured in the United States, which is uh, a pretty significant number versus 7% for adolescents. So the ACA requires plans to cover these preventive service visits for all ages as recommended by US Preventive Service Task Force NAAP and Bright Futures for Children and Adolescents without cost sharing so we were interested in, um, um, and CHIPRA has strengthened the quality of care provided to health outcomes for children, Medicaid and CHIP. And now we have a core set of children's health quality measures. So we're interested in this adolescent well care visit, which is one of the core measures. I'll show you all of the core measures here. There are nine core measures. Uh, but we, we're going to look at the adolescent well per visit to provider and see what's happened within that visit. So we asked the question of these, this data that we're going to look at is, what are the rates of screening and anticipatory guidance and time alone with provider among adolescents, young adults who received a preventive care in the past 12 months since implementation of ACI, ACA and CHIPRA in the United States? So we're using pool data from the medical expenditure panel survey sample. I imagine that many of you are familiar with this, the MAPS work. You know, this work is, is really a household survey where people are required to report on what happens 
regularly or when they go in for care, what type of care they get. So it's a representative sample nationally. The interesting thing about this report though, the information comes from the parent report of the adolescent receipt of screening and anticipatory guide in the past 12 months, whether the adolescent got time alone with the provider at their recent medical visit. So again, we're not certain what's going on from the adolescent's perspective, but this is what's going on from the parental report. So this is just shows you the change since 2007, 2009, up to 2017. Don't have the 2018 data about to be released soon. So you can see that well, um, that the receipt of well visits for adolescents has gone from about 40% up to about 50% of young people are getting this. Um, young adults, about not many are getting them. A third of them still are not getting any well care uh, or any preventative care. I work with a group called the Young Invincibles who do a lot of work in trying to get young adults in for preventative care. Most young adults, when you ask them about preventative care, it's not about seeing a doctor, it's about getting some exercise or going to some recreational facility to get exercise or, or changing their diet or, or you know, it, it's not about seeing a physician. And uh, so it's interesting that only a third of them, it's not surprising that only a third of them get in for uh, well care. The measures that were asked uh, that are used by MAPS, uh, there are hard measures like physical parameters, blood pressure, weight and height, and then a whole bunch of anticipatory guidance measures, which are physical activity, health eating, seatbelt use, helmet use, secondhand smoke, dental visits, and then young adults really just really get uh, the more physical parameters. And remember, these young adults, when we look at young adults, we're using an adult sample, a full adult sample, and targeting young adults for what, for what we're looking at. So these measures really uh, may be a better fit for all adults than just young adults. So these are the physical parameters. So our red here looks at well visit, and we're comparing those well visits to young people that at any healthcare visit. This is only for adolescents. So you can see that height, weight, blood pressure, the kind of core physical measures are you know, well attended to during well visit, less attended to for any healthcare visit, but still over about three quarters, even in those, the regular healthcare visit. Then when we look at anticipatory guidance among adolescents with a preventative visit versus any healthcare visit, um, there's a big difference in what you get if you're getting a well care visit versus a regular health care visit. Um, and then what we're going to do now is look at this slide, which looks at how many adolescents got all six topics addressed, uh, only about 16%, uh, even when they got a well visit and only about a quarter of young people got any time alone. And time alone could have been, uh, you know, 10 seconds with uh, a medical assistant because the parents reporting on what the parent observed in, in, the, in the visit. This summarizes generally for the both adolescents and young adults that all three services, uh, comparing it to preventative visit with the well visit, and it just summarizes uh, adolescent and compares it with young adults. And as you can see, young adults still really don't get much, whether they're, they're getting a well visit or getting any health care visit. So the well visit matters. Adolescents and adults who have had a past year well visit report higher rates of preventative services. However, you could argue that the data also shows that uh, young people see physicians 
uh, for health visits uh, at a fairly you know, regular rate. And perhaps we should encourage more preventative screening being done in some of the uh, any wealth healthcare visits for the adolescent and young adults. So I want to just now come to Medicaid data, which looks at, I want to show you what's happening within the Medicaid population in terms of adolescent wealth care. So, um, so these measures are, you know, the quality of care of children, Medicaid uh, and CHIP, they, one of the core measures is the well visit measure. And there was an incredible increase uh, in 2010 going to 2011, when, I, when the well visit measure was established, the adolescent well visit measure was established. And currently, you know, half of the states are, are reporting on the well visit measure. So let's look at what the report tells us. So once again, uh, the, the national average for adolescent well care visits is about half of young people throughout the United States are getting well visit. However, there's tremendous differences by states. So if you live in Mississippi, only 20% are getting well visits. If you live in New York, you get about 75 to 80%. If you live in Massachusetts, you get 90%. Texas has about 65% getting well visit. So it's all over the map about what, where you live really matters about getting well care. The last measure that I wanted to talk about was this national performance measures. So it was one of its 16 national performance measures for states in, um, and each state in 2016 had to choose an adolescent measure. And at that time, the adolescent well visit was selected by 38 of the states and territories. In 2020, it's dropped a little bit to 34. But when you look at the two other well, the two other measures that are there for states to select, the medical home is now about 39 states have selected the medical home for their adolescent measure. And then the transition measure is at a very high rate for states too. So in some ways, uh, the transition measure um, and the uh, medical home rate kind of embody a lot of what we're talking about when we talk about well care. It would be hard to give a talk in today's world without saying something about COVID-19 and how it's changed what we're doing. So HHS, um, you know, shortly after the pandemic, uh, started uh, allowed a broader array of non-compliant video software, which allowed us to use pretty much anything we had on hand for working, seeing adolescents and their families, seeing anybody. Uh, CMS all, also modified payment policies to encourage telemedicine and even allowed uh, billing for telephone encounters. Um, the DEA and SAMHSA allows credentialed clinicians to treat patients with opioid use disorders to initiate treatment with telemedicine. This was a big thing for us because we, we, uh, we have a uh, young a youth substance use program and we have a number of providers who are doing this. And our governor of California um, reaffirmed uh, what was HHS allowed. So we have tremendous support within this state to do this. We published a paper in 2020 on what we, our clinical program did uh, to increase telemedicine. I will tell you that prior to the pandemic, we had been working with UCSF Health on a continuous delay of telemedicine. We were, they kept on saying, you'll be next year. You'll be next year. So for five years, it went on for next year and next year. Well, the pandemic really changed things. So this is kind of a difficult slide to, to read, but it comes from the paper. So week one was when we were first kind of, was kind of pre-pandemic. It was really at the really initial stage of the pandemic. And as you can see, we were seeing a lot more patients in uh, 2020 
than we were seeing in 2019. The, and the bar uh, is nurse visits. So then when we went, started going towards telemedicine and opening up telemedicine, by the second week, we instituted telemedicine and we're seeing um, about most of our patients were being seen by telemedicine there. We were seeing fewer patients and we were seeing fewer patients because I think many, many patients were fearful of coming to clinics, even for any type of visit. They didn't really care. They did not want to see us unless they were really, really sick. The third week, uh, we saw a drop. It's hard to me to understand why we dropped, but it might have been just more and more people were not coming to clinic because they were afraid to come to our clinic. But by the fourth week, we were seeing more patients than we had seen the previous year with telemedicine. I will also tell you that we've monitored this over this year, and we are now seeing about 50%, we are seeing 50% uh, more patients in our clinical program than we saw a year ago. And we continue to see most of our patients by telemedicine. I'll end my talk with this, uh, the 21st Century Cures Act, which is the other policy uh, uh, thing that we're dealing with in a big way with adolescent health now. So this, um, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health and Information Technology issued a final ruling for the implement re requirements of this act. This act really accompanied the Affordable Care Act. And the, the goal of, of this, I think, is laudable because it wants, young, it wants individuals who are getting care to have access of what's going on with them, what happened. Or why am I, uh, you know, what are you, what, what's in my medical record? Can I see what's in my medical record? Will this help me uh, manage my health care? Will this help me make decisions about whether I'm going to choose a certain plan to be in? So I think the, the, it's a laudable goal. However, uh, it's very difficult for those of us who are caring for adolescents because all of our states have some form of confidentiality and confidentiality is really important for adolescents as they're learning how to kind of assume more responsibility for their health care. So the big question for us in the adolescent health world is how do we assume high quality care for teenagers where confidentiality is maintained through some state specific protection of confidential information it's that's shared with the clinicians. So I think it's an unanswered question. The Society for Health and Health and Medicine and, uh, is working hard on trying to figure out how we kind of uh, manage or this process. I will say at UCSF, we have had to really undergo major changes in the way we're writing things in our chart, managing our patients, recognizing that they're going to be seeing things uh, in particular for our eating disorder patients, weights are really important, but many adolescents don't want to know their weight if we're managing them. So there are a number of questions about sexual health, about substance use, et cetera, that states allow us to do certain things. However, the federal government with the Cures Act is restricting what we can do in some way. Just like to spend a few minutes on future directions. I would say the adolescents and young adults are on board with the new technology. And I'm not certain we will ever be able to go back to doing, to fully see all of our patients in person. I think most of them, uh, many of them, especially young adults do not wanna waste their time coming to a clinic unless it's a very meaningful uh, interview. So I'll tell you a little bit of what, what we're doing. That's, we'll, we'll come back to some, some of that, but we've been working on this thing called Health eCheck at UCSF. And it involves a tablet, which the young person uses uh, when, when they're waiting to see us. 
what this does, it really does all the screening that we would normally have done in person, but it's done by them uh, on their pad. And then it prints a document for the individual, the clinician. It goes into the EHR, but then it prints this out. So this is attached, um, given to the individual caring for the patient. So as you can see, it gets the name, gender, who the young person lives with, where they're going to school, or whether they aren't going to school, and something about their grades, what their work status is. But the, this also does a PHQ-9, and the young person here is minimal depression, and also the young person does the craft. So it all does all of this within 10 minutes and then prints this out for us. And so this young person is, uh, the clinician will know that prior to seeing this parent person, that he has minimal depression and also is high risk for substance use. So it really will color how he, the, the practitioner will care for this uh, individual. I wanna show a little more on this. This is a game. This is a personalized behavior change system. Elizabeth Ozer in our group is, uh, has been working with North Carolina State in developing this uh, personalized uh, behavior change system which, and there are several characters that play in this game. So it's based on gaming technology. And so when an individual would endorse that uh, they were using alcohol, they would then be flipped into a uh, place where they would have to navigate uh, a situation in which alcohol might be available or might not be available. And then it would uh, take you, you could choose wherever you wanna go and then it takes you to certain outcomes. And this is on the larger scale of, him, of this young man who is, his parents are away for the weekend. All of his friends know his parents are away. He's getting a lot of conflicting messages on what he should do. Uh, and he chooses to go down certain routes and ends up uh, in various uh, uh, situations that he wishes he was not in. And then he can backtrack and choose other ones and see what happens when he chooses though. I think this kind of gaming technology is going to be really useful for us to engage young people more in systems of, of care uh, in the future. So we talked about the AYAs um, and I want to say that I, I'll end where I began. Uh, I think that it's critical that we see how clinical-based services and community public health approaches can be integrated. We are now doing a, a trial in five states where we have what we call, we have a public health branch to this intervention and we have a clinic uh, branch to this intervention. And the public health branch is, is doing a lot of education in the public health sector around major depressive disorders, depression in general. And then the clinical based one is doing, is, is through their well visit, is screening young people for, for major depressive disorders and then getting them into care. So I can see these two approaches really important. So the background noise of young people maybe living in this community maybe that public health, you hear um, radio messages about depression, and then you come to your doctor's office and he or she is gonna screen you for depression. And it's no surprise to you that these uh, messages are kind of interactive. I think public policy has had a really incredibly important role over the last two decades. It's been incredibly effective at changing the landscape for adolescent and young adult health care through really responsible policies that monitor evidence-based outcomes. And I would argue that policies really have made a difference for young people and their families. Yet even with these current policies, uh, it's not, uh, none of us would be satisfied with a policy that only gets half of the people to come in for what we think might be important. And a third of young adults a young adults getting in. So I think that um, I would end with that. And once again, thank my colleagues um, 
for their work and working with me over the past uh, four decades. Um, and um, I would entertain questions now. And I also think this, this public policy has really changed the narrative for pediatricians around the importance of care for adolescents and young adults and how critically important it is to um, tackle uh, older kids, not just young children. Thank you so much. Charlie, thank you so much for just a wonderful talk and leading us through sort of current thinking on services and policy to really promote well-being of adolescents and young adults. Uh, typically in our department, we open up the first line of questions to our uh, trainees. Um, but in this case, I think we'll also give um, the Harper family some opportunity as well. So I'm seeing some hands raised. Um, Charlie, would you like me to moderate the question? Sure, that'd be great. Okay. Great, uh, Nini, I see your hand raised. Welcome, it's awesome to see you. Um, I don't know if you have a question, but feel free to, to come off mute. Maybe Dina, you can help us um, unmute everyone. No, I, I enjoyed the talk, what I heard of it. My Wi-Fi wasn't working, so I had to switch from my iPad to my phone. And um, this is new for me. I don't, this is my first Zoom call. <laughs> So, um, Dr. Irwin, thank you very much. Uh, I'll have to go back and look at the whole thing because I didn't, I was sort of in and out. But um, I don't have a question. My hand was not raised, but thank you very much. <laughs> uh, feel, free to con feel free to contact me through my email after you've heard it and you want more information. I'd be more than happy to speak with you. All right. Thank you very much. Great. Well, I think we're all we're all learners at heart. So um, feel free to raise hands or come off mic. And I see one of our trainees, Dr. Blum. Would you, <laughs> Dr. Blum, like to raise a question? Charlie, thanks. This was uh, both a terrific and fascinating uh, talk. Uh, my question is uh, related to. Uh, person power in the delivery of preventive care. So one of the issues and arguments historically that's been made is that there simply are not enough providers in the United States to provide comprehensive preventive care services to the entire child and adolescent population. So while it's aspirational, it is unrealistic. My question really is, has telemedicine shifted that? Has it created now the opportunities for not only greater reach, but greater utilization of uh, primary care providers in the provision of preventive healthcare services? And is this person power argument no longer uh, applicable. Uh, well, Bob, you can. I can always count on Bob asking the tough questions. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I would say that I think uh, that telemedicine. Uh, I, I'm biased. Obviously, you know, we we with the same number of people are seeing fifty percent more young people in our practices. Uh, that we support at UCSF Health in adolescent and young adult medicine. So I feel that that to me is shocking uh, that in spite of the pandemic, we've been able to do it under really, I think, adverse times. So I would say that I don't know if it's, um, I think if some of it's gonna depend on financing uh, is um, I was on I'm on this panel on Medicaid Forward, uh, and uh, there's some concern about will Medicaid uh, restrict phone visits um, or not pay for CMS? Will they will they retract that? Because if they retract that, that's going to have a really big impact on on uh, lower income and people who may not have the technology to, to interact. So I, I, think, um, I think 
I don't know anymore. I, you know, we le we've learned so much in the past 18 months that um, will will change. Will I think will change us. And I think the I think young people who participated through telehealth they may really force you know other you know adult practices to take to do more of this. I don't think they want us. They want to come in. Great. So I don't, did, I don't know if I answered your question, Bob. I'm just thinking it's, it certainly can increase, uh, you know, expand our care. I will, I'll give an example of what we're doing with patients in North, really Northern California, up near the Oregon border. They used to have to come down for us for, this is more subspecialty care, but in our, in our specialty adolescent medicine. So they used to have to drive six hours down, get a parking ticket in front of the hospital and then drive six hours back. They have to buy food, they have to pay a $40 parking ticket, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We now see those kids virtually and make a decision. Do they really need to come down to see us? And if they need some vital signs taken, we actually have them go to their primary care doctor's office and we, and we tell them help into their primary care doctor's office uh, to see them. And sometimes we work with their provider to manage the the problem that they were going to send their patient to us. It's just remarkable how, how user-friendly this has all become. Great. Thank, thanks so much for your thoughts on that, Charlie. Uh, David Page has a comment in the chat. He says, how would you amplify and reinforce the well visit message with youth engaged community partners? And I know many in our uh, community who are uh, involved with the Center for Adolescent Health, as well as in the Global Early Adolescent Study, will be very interested to sort of hear your thoughts about that, about how we engage the messaging with our community partners. You know, it's interesting. I, would, I was almost flipping it the other way that uh, how, can, uh, how can we get the messaging <laughs> into clinical practice is, um, I, I, I think that the, um, I always use the example example of tobacco is um, you know, we have billboards every place, don't vape, don't do this, et cetera. So they're getting all those messages and then a young person comes to the clinic and they never get asked if they vape or smoke. So in a sense, the, they're, you know, they're getting a negative reinforcement from the clinician when the public health community is really doing their job, but we're not doing our job. Um, I think that um, I'm not certain how to, ex is the question about how to, how, how to I'm, not, I'm not certain I understand the question anymore. <laughs> David, do you want to come off mute? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Irwin. The first part of my question was that it was a great talk, and I really appreciate your coming to Baltimore, at least virtually. So that, uh, that was great. Uh, as a fellow pediatrician uh, and limited to 24 minutes uh, once a year to maybe 50 to 75 percent of the population, uh, it, the reinforcing that uh, message, whether it's tobacco or helmets or um, any one of the critical issues, uh, it, it, in my view, uh, requires a, a continued uh, reinforcement and the reinforcement in terms of hopefully a common message that uh, speaks to, uh, speaks to the uh, youth without confusing them. So uh, I, uh, I'm impressed. I'm really pleased to see what we can accomplish within a clinic visit. But I'm also suspect uh, with regard to its uh, uh, long-term implications. And uh, I think uh, there are many community programs in which the uh, youngsters uh, engage in, which could be helpful uh, in spreading this message and reinforcing it. It's, uh, it's uh, asked respectfully uh, and recognizing uh, an important role of the pediatrician, but uh, really in many ways a limited one. You know, I'm, I'm interested because we, we, like I said it towards the end, we have this um, trial just starting with, with five states. 
<clears throat> that we're getting um, the public the public health message is are being developed to really support you know what the clinicians are doing in terms of screening because clearly if you screen for major major depressive disorders and you identify the young person with a depressive disorder unless there's a community based you know you can send them to finding a therapist is almost impossible these days so so how how does how is that going to play out in terms of the community's ability to su to support that and I, I i'm unclear on how it is going to play out but I think it's aspirational also to try to figure out how messaging can be continued to be delivered in communities uh, that really is based within the communities developing it with you because, you know, I'm not certain. Well, uh, it, 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 uh, if I may, uh, just, uh, it's true, it's aspirational, but we faced, uh, we faced uh, continue to face a similar problem uh, as an example in the WIC program, where there is uh, one WIC nutritionist who's providing information, but then there's conflicting information that's provided or lack of reinforcement uh, with regard to uh, subsequent uh, visits to, uh, of all people, a pediatrician, but also uh, uh, the school nurse and other uh, uh, the school uh, coaches and sports and so on. So you get a, a cacophony of messages that are confusing and ultimately uh, uh, lose their impact. In a study we did a number of years ago with regard to educational messages, absence of reinforcement, uh, the extinction rate is rather uh, uh, striking that over six months, the recall is uh, rather poor. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's what prompts the question. Uh, so right. I'll stop with that, but thank you again for a very exciting lecture. We have time for, for one more question, and it, in some ways it builds on the message that we're having. And Christy Bethel put in the chat, um, asking whether or not you provide adolescent well care to teen mothers, and if so, do you leverage the early childhood visit to encourage them to come in for those well visits? So Christy, thank you for reinforcing the life course approach. Um, but just curious on your thoughts on that, if that's an opportunity we should be thinking more about, Charlie. You know, I think it's an opportunity. We, we don't provide care to uh, uh, pregnant teenagers. Uh, um, the, the general pediatric group within our, within our UCSF Health uh, focuses on, on um, young children and um, adolescent uh, parents, um, so I I can't answer what what they're doing in that in that program. It seems to me it still it would be a great great opportunity. There are quite a few more questions that are popping up in the chat, so I will get these to you because I know folks would love to continue to engage. But in the uh, knowing it's also time. I just really want to thank you for a, an inspired conversation and for really helping us continue to celebrate uh, Dr. Harper's legacy, which is just so critical to the work that we're all engaged in with a focus on prevention and thinking about the linkages between clinical services and population health based uh, public health and public policy services. So I'll ask everyone to join me uh, in giving Dr. Irwin just a huge round of applause. Um, and I think we also owe you a really, really good dinner in Baltimore for doing a Zoom <laughs> uh, lecture this year. So you, you've now had it on recording that we owe you big time. So thanks everyone uh, so much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to eventually seeing everybody in person soon. So take care, everybody. <laughs>